The 12th century BCE was a period of widespread crisis, which ultimately brought the end of the Bronze Age. Many long-standing civilizations were completely destroyed, while others took centuries to rebuild to their former glory. The scholars have variously attributed such large-scale disturbance to a number of socio-economic problems and natural disasters that supposedly had weakened many of the great cities and kingdoms, and created a path for groups of scarcely attested peoples to get together and forcefully change the world order. To the ancient Egyptians, they were just the foreigners that conspired against them and other contemporary civilizations, but to us, they are better known as the Sea Peoples. The period of the Late Bronze Age was considered to be a time of relative prosperity of the great civilizations, most of which reached their peak when it came to wealth, influence and military strength. Five of the main powers of this period were variously recorded as the Egyptian Kingdom, the Hittite Empire, Babylonia, Assyria and Mycenaean Greece. These powers, especially the first four, constantly engaged with each other in trade, diplomacy but occasionally also warfare. Most notably, Egyptians and Hittites constantly fought over the control of Levant, which culminated in the Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BCE. Other kingdoms did have their fair share of conflicts, with the rising Assyrian Empire trying to expand at the expense of the Babylonians, while Mycenaeans constantly strived to further their influence in Asia Minor. However, the relative balance of power remained, until things quickly started deteriorating at the end of the 13th and the first half of the 12th century BCE. Within the time span of just several decades, great kingdoms of the Bronze Age suffered successive and destructive attacks from an enemy that they were clearly not ready for. Cities across the Mycenaean Greece were destroyed in quick succession, the Hittite Empire was completely wiped out from the map, and the Assyrians and Babylonians shrunk in size to territories slightly bigger than their capital cities. The ancient Greeks attributed the fall of Mycenae to an event known as the return of the Heraclidae. After five successive invasions over the course of a century, the so-called successors of Heracles, together with their Dorian, Aetolian and other allies, were able to bring down what was ravaged and the war-torn Mycenae, after which the whole region entered a period of the Dark Ages and would not recover until centuries later. The Hittites, on the other hand, did not live to tell the story as their civilization was completely eradicated. The only power that stood its ground and was able to repel the enemy was the new kingdom of Egypt. It is through the Egyptians that we learn of the Sea Peoples, an apparent confederation of many countries that swiped through Asia Minor and Levant and destroyed everything in their path until finally meeting their match in the Egyptian pharaohs. The famous passage from Pharaoh Ramses III reads as follows. The foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms, from Hatti, Kodi, Karkemi, Sharzawa and Alatia on, being destroyed at one time. Besides this inscription, which was commissioned in about 1150 BCE, the list of the Sea Peoples, their descriptions and whereabouts are attested in several Egyptian sources and narratives of three pharaohs from the 13th and 12th centuries BCE. From these sources, the Egyptians mention the following groups. Sheridan, Luca, Karkisa, Shekelesh, Ekwesh, Teresh, Denian, Tieker, Peleset, and Weshesh. The earliest Egyptian inscriptions concerning one of these groups date to the early reign of Ramses II in the 13th century BCE. In the second year of his reign, the pharaoh records repulsing a sea attack on the Nile Delta by what he calls the unruly Sheridan. The unruly Sheridan 
whom no one had ever known how to combat. They came boldly sailing in their warships from the midst of the sea, none being able to withstand them. Ramses ultimately defeated the attack and captured many of the pirates, many of which were then incorporated into the Egyptian army and settled along the Hittite frontier. Sheridan warriors were held in a high regard by the pharaoh, so much that he had employed them as his personal bodyguard. The origins of the Sheridan are still debated among the scholars, with their connection to the sea being the only thing that's for certain. They have been associated with Asia Minor, but even more prominently with the island of Sardinia and its Nogaric civilization. Along with linguistic similarities of the name, the Sheridan were noted by the Egyptians for their horned helmets and round shields, a feature also typical of the Nogaric warriors of Sardinia. Several years later, the Sheridan took part at the Battle of Kadesh, fighting among the elite units of the Egyptian army against the Hittite forces. Here we record the second constituent of the Sea Peoples, the Luka. Just like the Sheridan, the Luka people were present at the famed Battle of Kadesh. However, they did not side with the Egyptians, but instead appeared among the allies of the Hittite Empire. However, with the Luka, we at least do have a clear picture of who they were. They came from the Luka lands in southwestern Anatolia, a Hittite and Egyptian name for the region of Lukia, home of the Lukians. The Lukians were not under authority of a single ruler, but consisted of various cities led by their respective chieftains. They were mostly independent of both Hittites and Mycenaeans and were infamous for their piracy. They would continue to cause problems for the Egyptians, most notably to Ramses' successor Merneptah, who himself had to deal with several hostile encounters with the Sea Peoples. Another group, which just like the Lycians joined the Hittite Empire at the Battle of Kadesh, is Karkisa or Karkia. While they may have taken part in some of the raids, they are not necessarily always included in the list of the Sea Peoples. Either way, Karkisa represented the region of Caria in Asia Minor, and its warriors usually fought as mercenaries for the Hittites and possibly the Sea Peoples, rather than being a part of any particular alliance. During the reign of Merneptah, several more groups joined the list of the Egyptian enemies. The Shekelesh are a bit more mysterious when it comes to determining who they were. They were depicted with flashy and colorful armors, wearing medallions around their neck. Besides the name, we do not know much of their whereabouts. Various theories have been formed, pointing to Asia Minor, the Aegean and even Sicily. The Anatolian hypothesis associates them with Sagalassos, a city of Pisidia, a small region to the northeast of Lucia. The Sicilian theory mentions Sicils or Siciloi, a seafaring tribe that occupied the eastern part of Sicily during the Iron Age and gave the island its name. A yet another theory relies on the Hittite records, in which King Shipilulima II mentions the so-called Shikalayu to his Ugarit governor, an equally mysterious name of a seafaring group which the Hittite king describes as dwelling on their ships. Perhaps a little less controversial are the Ekwesh. Known to the Egyptians as the Ekwesh of the countries of the sea, they have been generally accepted by the scholars to be the Mycenaean Greeks. The Achaeans, or Achiawans as they were known to the Hittites, were entering a heavy decline by the beginning of the 12th century BCE. Known for both warfare and seafaring prowess, more and more of the Achaeans became tempted with leaving the Greek mainland as it descended into chaos, instead pursuing overseas adventures in search of wealth and even potentially new lands to settle. Such campaigns brought the Achaeans to Cyprus, putting an end to the kingdom of Alasia and having numerous Achaean Greek kingdoms emerge on the island during the Iron Age. Another, however mythological account, recounts Odysseus and his so-called Cretan lie, where he claims to have launched an assault on Egypt at the Nile Delta, ultimately unsuccessful. 
the hero then supposedly had to spend time in Egypt, living there for seven years and obtaining great wealth before coming back to the Aegean. Although a myth, the story had notable correlation with the Sea People's attack on the Nile Delta, where they were eventually defeated by Ramses III, with some of them then staying at the pharaoh's service. Another group that accompanied the Aquash in their assaults were the Teresh. Also known as the Teresh of the Sea, they have been loosely associated with Tarusa or Wilusa from the Hittite records, better known as Troy or Ilion. A different theory associates them with the Tyrrhenians, a Greek name for the Etruscans who according to some ancient writers supposedly lived in the Aegean before migrating to Italy. The Denian were unsurprisingly also associated with the Aegean. Depicted with typical Aegean gear of the end of the Bronze Age, the Denian are most prominently associated with the Danaeans, which besides the Achaeans were also a name that was synonymous with the Mycenaean Greeks. Much earlier Egyptian attestations of the Mycenaeans appear in the 15th century BCE during the reign of Tutmosis III. There, the land of the Mycenaeans was called Denea or Tanayu, with some of its major cities identified by the Egyptians as Mycenae, Naupleon and Thebes. The exact relation between these two names when it came to their usage by the Mycenaeans themselves is not known, so it remains difficult to determine if one was used more broadly and another was more specific when it came to the Mycenaean world. The Teyeker appeared to be similar to the Denian, at least when it came to their equipment. The head dress was easily recognizable, likely representing the same trait of some of the other supposedly Aegean groups. Their possible origins include some of the tribes inhabiting Crete, while some link them to the Trachians at the northern parts of the Aegean Sea. The Teyeker were among the peoples that eventually settled in Canaan, presumably with the oversight of the pharaoh, who at least claimed to have brought them under the Egyptian control. In a papyrus text, known as the story of Wenamun, and dated to about 1000 BCE, the Teyeker were reported to have settled at the city of Dor and eventually brought it up from a minor town into a major port city. Just like the Teyeker, the Peleset were also a group that would ultimately settle in Canaan. Their origins and identity, however, seems to be less of a mystery than most, since Peleset represents an Egyptian rendering of the name Philistines. Their origins are widely accepted as areas inhabited by the Mycenaeans. Unsurprisingly, local pottery of the early Philistine settles in Ashdod, Ekron, Ashkelon and Gath resembled the pottery of the Mycenaeans shortly before their collapse at the end of the Bronze Age. Moreover, at Ekron, a Megaran-style building was discovered, a unique feature of the Mycenaean culture. Biblical sources are perhaps even more specific, connecting the Philistines to Kaptor, or Crete. The island of Crete at the time of the Sea Peoples was home of several Greek and Hellenized tribes, one of which were the Pelasgians, perhaps an original name synonymous with Peleset and Philistines. While the Peleset were certainly among the less enigmatic of the Sea Peoples, the last group is the polar opposite. The Weshesh were perhaps the least attested among the Egyptian adversaries. In fact, the only thing that we know about them is their name. Some scholars have hypothesized that Weshesh might be one perhaps smaller clan of the Achaeans, while others discussed about possible Carian or even Italic origin. At this point, there is just no sufficient evidence to make a conclusion. What do you think? Which theories about the Sea People's origins do you agree with? What are those that you disagree with? Do you have your own theories? Please let us know in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe. We're introducing the Super Thanks. The Super Thanks button allows you, the viewers, to show an extra gratitude to the channel and get your comments highlighted and noticed not only by myself, but other viewers as well. Underneath the video, you will see a heart with a dollar sign in it.
You can enter any amount that you find suitable. Hopefully you enjoy the content. Special thanks to History with Sai, Nico, Chris Ernst, Panayotis Yanopoulos, Fred Leckie, Tim Lane, ABC Shake, Derek Wildstar, Padre91, Argiris Margaritis, Well Sally Briggs, Labelle Olmier, Mercy and Tain, Luis Aldames, Winner Illumination and the State Care for their continuous support. This was 1XTV and we'll see you again soon.